Welcome to the Calvary Room with Pastor Sam Allen. When the scriptures talk about God choosing us in Ephesians, it says he chose us in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world, not so we could go to heaven or hell, but so we could be holy and blameless before him in love. It's a better way to ask the question, you see, not where do you want to spend eternity, but are you interested in holiness, in purity, in blamelessness? Only with Jesus, only with you. On today's walk down the Calvary we begin our study of this series entitled Jesus, from Genesis to Revelation. Today, we will begin to look at the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis and read of how Jesus was with God even in the beginning. We read here in Genesis 1-1, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Genesis, it's the book of beginning. Now, these first 11 chapters are foundational. All we need to know about how we got here and how we got in the mess we're in and what God's done about it is found in these first chapters. We'll look today at creation, at the fall, at the flood, and then the Tower of Babel, which leads to, well, the dispersion of the nation. Let me say our time together, there will be no theories, just facts, except for those baseball references, of course. We're going to see answers to some of life's most important questions, like how'd I get here? And basically, it falls into two possibilities. You were either created by and for a loving, all-powerful, almighty God, or you just happen to evolve. I don't remember where I first read it, but it, it simplified the whole process of evolution from the goo to the zoo to you. And so if you don't believe that, then you must believe in creation. If you say, well, I don't believe in evolution or creation, well, then you're really in trouble. Well, why am I here? Pastor Justin, as he was getting ready to, well, as he shared in his last message, preparing to move with his wife to Kenya to minister there, shared about the greatest commandment, to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength and to love our neighbor as ourself. That's basically why we're here. Now there's more to loving God. We worship him, not idols. We serve him, not ourselves. But it all comes down to love for him that manifests itself in obedience to him. So how'd I get here? Why am I here? And where am I going next? It reminds me of presidential hopeful Bob Dole. He ran for office back in 1996. He was 73 years old. And when they posed the question, true story, boxers or briefs, he said, depends. <laughs> Needless to say, he did not win that election. There are some images we just don't want from our commander in chief. But the idea is important to us today. Why? Because there are only two paths to walk. The one that's walking toward and with God or the one that's walking away and from God. And if you're on the, the path God's purposed and planned for you, the destination will be heaven. If you're going the other direction and you don't turn it around, well, the destination is hell. Some are surprised to, to find that the Bible never really offers us that choice. Do you want to go to heaven or do you want to go to hell? It's true that our decision about who will serve and who will worship and and, and who will honor in life will determine our ultimate destination. But when the scriptures talk about God choosing us in Ephesians, it says he chose us in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world, not so we could go to heaven or hell, but so we could be holy 
and blameless before him in love. It's a better way to ask the question, you see, not where do you want to spend eternity, but are you interested in holiness, in purity, in blamelessness, in rightness with God? Because if not, heaven's not for you. Everyone there is about that. And that's where we're really focused as a people that loves our Lord and wants to please our Lord. He makes us holy and blameless positionally in Christ Jesus. And then he says, practically, we need to learn to live that out. Well, the answer, of course, to the question, how do we get in the mess we're in? doesn't happen until chapter three, but we begin here in chapter one where we already read in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word created there is the word bara in the Hebrew. It speaks of creating something from nothing. And let me just say, only God can do that. If you know those who are into the new age thing, you know, I'm God, you're God, small g, of course, but little gods, no, we're not, and no, they're not, and no, you're not. There's only one true and living God, creator of heaven and earth. And when people say, well, I don't believe that, I think we're all gods, legends in our own mind, perhaps, but... But all gods, no, listen, here's a simple test. Okay, God can say, let there be light, and there was. What can you do with the word? What can your word create except maybe some stress or distress or a mess? Or, well, you can bless and, and encourage with the word as well. Well, theories like the Big Bang, of course, very popular for a season, less popular, I believe, today, although still believed by many, have one basic problem. Oh, there are others, but one foundational problem. There was nothing, then there was something, and then something blew up. I still have to ask, how did we go from nothing to something? Because you have to have something. And the first law of thermodynamics says neither... Uh, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. So someone or something had to put into place all we see and how it operates. The second law, entropy, says everything's moving toward chaos from organization to disorganization. Now, I'll just say, if you believe Genesis 1-1, you should have no trouble believing the rest of the scripture. But if you don't, you're in serious trouble. Well, chapter one, we have the seven days of creation. When we get to chapter two, he kind of takes us, after giving us the, the bigger picture of creation, he gets a little more down in the dirt, as it were, hands-on, and tells us more how he went about at least forming man and such. But track with me on some of this. I'm just summarizing for time's sake. Your mission, your you know, responsibility was and is to read through the passage we'll be covering each week. So this week, 1 through 11. Next week, 12 through 50. So Genesis 1, first six days of creation, five times as God's creating, he says, and it was good. God saw that it was good. One time at the end of creation, he says he saw that it was very good. So everything God created was good. Everyone God created. Well, there were only a couple, right? Adam and Eve, they were perfect in his sight. They were created in his image. We'll come back to it because it is such a huge, huge thing. Well, God said, let there be light, verse three, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good and God divided the light from the darkness and called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So this is kind of how it goes each day. He sets himself to create something or some part of the ultimate creation. And at the end of the day, the sun, you know, the evening and the morning were 
Well, the first, the second, and so on and so on. Day two, he creates the atmospheric heavens and separates the waters above from the waters below. Day three, he separates the dry land from the seas. He creates the food supply, the grass, the herbs, the fruit trees, and such. Day four, the sun, moon, and the stars were told for signs and for seasons. Now, now see what's taking place. He's created something from nothing. Now he's fashioning and forming it in such a way, creating other things to sustain what? Life. Before he creates the birds, before he creates the fish, before he creates the beast, before he creates us, he wants to create an environment that will be hospitable to us and will provide for us. And that's exactly what he spells out here. Common sense says this could have never just happened. Given all the eons of time that some try to tell us were required and must have existed, this could have never come about except by one who was able to actually create. So we are up to day four, the sun, moon, stars for signs and seasons. I don't know if you're aware, but in our visible universe, there are 76 billion stars. Now that is a huge number, one that possibly only Congress could begin to comprehend as they look toward future budgets. But it's a seven with 22 zeros following it. That's just the visible universe. Of course, there is a lot beyond our visible universe. And so get this, God not only created it all, we're told he placed all of those stars where they are and he knows them by name. It's an amazing declaration. Day five, the sea creatures, the fish, the birds of the air, and by the way, he will say to each of them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That's his plan here. That will be his plan for Adam and Eve. That will be his plan after the fall. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. So where do we go? Day six, the land, the cattle, the creeping things, the beast of the earth, Finally, man and woman, Adam and Eve. Verse 27 of chapter one, take a look at it. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. By the way, You'll read this phrase 11 times if you walk through just Genesis 1, according to its kind. Everything God made would reproduce according to its kind. We get to day seven and God takes a day off. It's a day of rest. He sets the Sabbath apart. He sanctifies it as a day of rest. We'll see that some get confused about it. Of course, this is pre-law, so he's not laying down a law that you have to rest, but he did build into us his, you know, crown of his creation, the need for a day of rest. But beyond that, it's going to point us to, as so many other things will, to our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Well, Genesis chapter 2, as I mentioned, God kind of gets hands on. Look at verse seven with me. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Back in the original creation, as God was speaking, the word was bara. Here when it says he formed man, it's asha. What's the difference? Well, this word means literally to mold and to shape. 
You have to be hands-on in that process. See, it's as the potter would the clay. God takes and fashions and forms Adam, making him exactly how he wanted him to be. And he created him in his image. Male and female, we already read, he created them in his image. This is important. I want to plant the seed of this and then we'll see it kind of develop as we go along. To be created in God's image doesn't mean to look like him, but to be like him. How do we know? God is spirit. Those who worship must worship him in spirit and in truth. So we don't know what God looked like, but we do know what God is like. That means when he created Adam and Eve, he created them pure and holy. He gave them the capacity for choice. He let them make decisions just as he himself makes decisions. He gave them, well, his purity, his holiness, his righteousness. He clothed them, if you will, in holiness and in glory. So he forms them. And then in verses eight and nine, the Lord God planted a garden. Actually, he formed Adam so far here, planted a garden eastward in Eden, put the man whom he'd formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. No, trees abound. All the fruit you could ever need or want or desire. There are two trees there in the middle of the garden and one of them is the tree of life. I'm certain at this point they were enabled and allowed to eat from it. But after the fall, they'll be kept, they'll be banished from the Garden of Eden and they'll be kept from eating from the tree of life lest they live forever in their fallen state. So the other tree, the only tree forbidden to them was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We're gonna look briefly at God's interaction with them as Satan's, uh, you know, challenges to Eve specifically. But, but I want you to see it at this point before we get to all that, and that's just around the corner. Verse 18, the first time you'll read in the scripture of something not being good because God said, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's very good. And then he says, it's not good for man to be alone. Fellas, I want to say still true. Gals, if you're married, know it's true. He's not safe without you. He's there as partner with you. So just, you know, take it to heart. I'm not saying he couldn't get through an hour or two, but you don't want to leave him too long on his own. It's not good that man should be alone. So he, and you know the story well, he put Adam to sleep. He took a rib from Adam. He made Eve from and for Adam and brought Eve to Adam. And Adam saw her and he said, wow, this is it. It's very close to what actually happened. I don't know his exact words, but I'm pretty sure it was even far more excited than that. Because as he was looking at all that God had created, and he was responsible by the way to name everything. So he's like, okay, aardvark, uh, you know, possum, uh, hippopotamus, giraffe. And he notices everything's paired up and paired off. And he probably noticed things were already reproducing and he figures it out. Hey, I don't have anyone to partner with me. I don't have anyone to complete me. So God makes Eve from and for Adam, brings her to Adam. And the two we read, well, they become husband and wife. The two become one flesh. Verse 24 of Genesis 2, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. It's leave and cleave. And it says they were both naked, the man and his wife, verse 25, and were not ashamed. Why were they not ashamed? Because there was no sin. And shame 
is a result of sin. But there is something else. While the scripture doesn't flat out say it, I can't help but picture them as we will someday be clothed in heaven, clothed in his righteousness, clothed in his glory, spectacular, beautiful, holy, pure, perfect in every way. Well, the first big decision for them happens in chapter three. And I don't know how complicated life is when you serve a perfect God and live in a perfect environment, married to a perfect person. None of us can begin to imagine that. Though all of us believe our wife, if you're a married man, you better believe your wife is perfect for you because if you believe anything else, you're in trouble. But uh, perfect people, imagine it. Well, it's hard to. Well, they had to figure out at best, what are you in the mood for? Oranges or apples, you know, persimmons or I don't know, you know. What do you want to eat? But there was one tree, remember, forbidden to, to them. Now, know this, and this is for sure. There was nothing wrong with the fruit. The problem wasn't in the fruit. The choice was believe God and obey God and live forever or believe a lie and disobey God and die. It seems like that would have been an easy choice, a simple decision. Let's see, it's life or death. I like life. I like life and we're living in an imperfect world with imperfect spouses and imperfect children and imperfect parents. And, and so all of that to say this, this, this shows us how the fall comes about, how we ended up in the mess we're in. There was temptation from without, you're aware. Satan comes and he begins to question God's word. Did God say you're not to eat of every tree in the garden? And of course, Eve says, no, we can eat anything we want except the one tree, the knowledge of good and evil. The knowledge, by the way, here will be an experiential knowledge. They didn't even know theoretically what evil was, except God said, don't do this. So that would fall into the category of, hey, this is the only sin there is. This is the only evil there is. And so he questions God's word. Then he denies God's word because God said, in the day you eat, you will die. Satan says, you will not die. Now, it's more than my opinion. It's fact. God's always right Satan is a liar in the father of lies. And she made a choice. I know she was tricked. I know she was duped. I know she was deceived. But she still did what God told her never to do. And there's a reason for it. She saw that the tree was pleasant to the eyes, good for food, and a tree desirable to make one wise. Get this. Temptation from without as he questions the word, as he denies the word, and then he impugns God's character saying, God just knows in the day you eat, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Get this. They were already like God. They were created in his image. They, they were perfect in every way. You can't improve upon perfection. And so the idea that there's something God's keeping from you, that's true. Sin, devastation, shame, pain, suffering, all the things that will follow her decision. Yes, she was tricked, but she still decided. And we're told, by the way, in James, I'll read it to you, each one is tempted because this is what's going on inside of her. Each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And when desires conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. We're glad you could join us today on this walk on the Calvary Road. The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico. You can visit our website at cctico.com or download the CCTico app 
connect with us and to find more from Pastor Sam. You could also listen to the Calvary Road podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We hope to hear from you. And until next time, may the Lord bless your walk down the Calvary Road. And your grace.